Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on cyclic AMP signaling. And in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to specifically look at how uh, calcium oscillations can cause cyclic AMP oscillations. So the link between calcium oscillations and cyclic AMP oscillations. Now we've already actually seen an example of this long, long ago when we looked at the heart. The heart has a mechanism by which uh, calcium going up can then lead to cyclic AMP going down. And when calcium goes down, cyclic AMP goes up. And then uh, the cyclic AMP going up when the calcium goes down then uh, activates the, um, the L-type calcium channels in the heart muscle, and that produces us uh, a greater influx of calcium when the calcium next comes in. And basically, it makes the spikes in calcium level more pronounced, and, um, and um, that leads to an increase in the force of contractility that the heart muscle can produce. So it leads to a positive inotropic effect. Now what we're going to do is look at those uh, calcium oscillations and cyclic a AMP oscillations in a bit more generality. So, uh, what you often get in tissues is calcium oscillations. So let's just start with a calcium oscillation. So basically, if on this axis here, this x-axis, we plot time, and on the y-axis we plot calcium concentration intracellularly, then often what we see in many sorts of tissues, you see oscillations in calcium levels. So you'll see it go up and then back down, up and down, like so. Okay, and it has some sort of it has a certain sort of time period over which this um, this wave, if you like, happens. Okay, so what's actually happening on the level of the cell is that the calcium level intracellularly is going up and down. So it's not just a case of calcium goes up and then stays up for ages and then comes down in a calcium signal. In some tissues you have this oscillatory uh, calcium behaviour and that can be very, very important. For instance, this is certainly happening in cardiomyocytes to um, create uh, contraction and then relaxation, contraction and relaxation. Okay, so in many tissues this is important. So, what we're going to discuss is how calcium oscillating like this, and calcium is a major intracellular uh, signal, signaling molecule, how that also interacts with the other major intracellular signaling molecule, which is cyclic AMP, and these two really are the two great intracellular signaling molecules, cyclic AMP and calcium. And in fact, when calcium, sorry, when cyclic AMP was discovered in, I think, the 1950s, it really sort of um, put a halt on any sort of research into calcium signaling because people thought cyclic AMP was the major, you know, it was the, it was the intracellular signaling molecule. Everything was turning out to be signaled uh, by cyclic AMP. But then, uh, in more recent years, what's happened is that, well, n recent, 1980s, uh, calcium became went back into fashion and people started looking at calcium as another potential very important intracellular signaling molecule and now we see that they're both interacting together and so we're going to look at that in this video. Okay, so basically roughly there are two ways that cyclic AMP can oscillate with calcium oscillations like this. So basically if I plot cyclic AMP concentration against time as well and I'll do this nicely below the other one then the two scenarios that you can have is that either uh, cyclic AMP goes up at the same time that the calcium goes up, like so. So it's basically just an exact copy of the graph above. When, cyclic a when calcium goes up, rather, cyclic AMP goes up, i.e. it's in phase. Now this is what is known as phasic oscillation. So when uh, a rise in calcium corresponds to a rise in cyclic AMP, then the cyclic AMP oscillations are said to be phasically uh, oscillating with calcium, basically. So phasic oscillations. All right, and this again is the concentration of intracellular cyclic AMP. Let me just label that axis. All right. So the other scenario is that the exact opposite happens, and this is what happens in cardiomyocytes. Okay. So this time, what can happen is that when calcium goes up, cyclic AMP goes down. So uh, when cyclic AMP is high, 
calcium is low and when cyclic AMP is low, that's when calcium is high. So basically, it's going to start off at the high level. It's then going to go down when calcium goes up and then it'll go back up again when calcium goes down. It'll go down again when calcium goes back up, up again when calcium goes back down, and then finally down again when the calcium goes up again, like so. And that sort of an oscillation is completely out of phase with the um, calcium oscillations and is therefore called antiphasic oscillations. Okay, so what we're going to do in this video is we're going to look at mechanisms underlying uh, both phasic oscillations and antiphasic oscillations, i.e. how do we link uh, calcium uh, oscillating uh, to cyclic AMP, either oscillating in phase or out of phase. Okay, so we'll begin by looking at how uh, cyclic AMP can uh, oscillate in phase with the calcium. Okay, so this is a mechanism by which it can oscillate in phase with the calcium. So basically, when calcium goes up, there are certain adenylyl cyclases which are stimulated by calcium. And those two adenylyl cyclases which are stimulated by calcium are adenylyl cyclase 1 and adenylyl cyclase 8. These are the two calcium-stimulated adenylyl cyclases. So these are calcium-stimulated adenylyl cyclases, which means that when calcium, uh, calcium goes up in the cytoplasm, it's going to cause these two adenylyl cyclases uh, to become more active. And we'll just have a brief, um, brief discussion of why um, calcium, well, how calcium actually activates adenylyl cyclase 1 and adenylyl cyclase 8. Okay, so let's start with adenylyl cyclase 8. Okay, so adenylyl cyclase 8, so let's just draw out its structure here. So here it's got the general structure of an adenylyl cyclase with these two uh, transmembrane domains, TM1 and TM2, each consisting of six membrane spanning alpha helices, like so. Okay, so here is the transmembrane domain 1, TM1, and here is the transmembrane domain 2. Okay, and you've got the end terminus down here, you've got the C1 loop down here, which can be divided into two portions, uh, C1A, this first portion here, and C1B, the second portion here. And then you finally have the C2 portion, which is this uh, carboxyl tail over here, which again can be divided into two portions, namely C2A, which is this closer bit here, and then C2B. Right, so the active aden... In fact, this, this goes for both adenylyl cyclase 1 and adenylyl cyclase 8. But the active enzyme, uh, the active adenylyl cyclase enzyme, which is going to take ATP and uh, convert it into cyclic AMP and pyrophosphate, it's made up out of the dimerization of this C1A region here and this C2A region here. So those two portions have to dimerize in order to make the active enzyme. And basically what calcium is going to do is it's going to promote that dimerization. So um, the adenylyl cyclase 8 itself does not actually have a, a calcium binding domain. Instead, it relies on the protein calmodulin. So let's just have a quick revision of calmodulin. So calmodulin in cartoons is generally drawn like so. <coughs> it's drawn as having two lobes uh, an N lobe and a C lobe. And both of these two lobes have two calcium binding domains on them, which are both EF hand domains. So you have two calcium binding domains, and this is an EF hand dimer here. And, um, <coughs> excuse me. And you have the same thing on the other lobe, the C lobe. You have two EF hand domains, an EF dimer, EF hand dimer basically, which are just structures polypeptide structures which bind calcium. So overall, calmodulin has four calcium binding sites. Now, when calmodulin has no calcium bound to any of these um, binding sites, it's said to be apocalmodulin. So apocalmodulin means calmodulin with no calcium bound to it. Now, when calcium comes and binds in all four of these um, binding domains on the apocalmodulin, it's turned into what's known as a calcium calmodulin complex, so Ca2 calmodulin. And uh, what this causes is it causes the um, 
the lobes to move outwards, so they, they're less compact, basically. And when they move outwards, what it causes is a change in conformation between, of this linker that links the two um, lobes. So initially, this linker is a linear polypeptide, but what happens is when they move outwards, that linker between the two lobes becomes helical, and it becomes an alpha helix-like structure here. So you get an alpha helix linking uh, the, the two lobes of calmodulin. So this is an alpha helix. Okay, right. And this is when um, both of these binding sites are occupied by calcium. So I'll put something in there to denote that calcium is bound to all four of them. So this orange color denotes that calcium is bound to all four of them. Okay, so this is a calcium calmodulin complex now, and that's often denoted Ca2 plus CAM for calmodulin. And I should have said that APO calmodulin is often denoted APO CAM for calmodulin there. Okay, so um, basically, APO calmodulin, in the case of adenylyl cyclase 8, Apocalmodulin binds to this N terminus of the polypeptide that makes up adenylyl cyclase 8. So basically, it binds here. So here's our apocalmodulin molecule bound to the N terminus of this polypeptide. Then basically, when calcium goes up in the in the um, cytoplasm, calcium is going to bind to the binding sites of that apocalmodulin molecule, and a the calcium calmodulin complex is then transferred from this N terminus, and specifically it binds to a portion of the N terminus known as the calmodulin recruitment domain. So this portion of the N terminus to which apocalmodulin binds is the calmodulin recruitment domain. Okay. However, when the calcium binds to the calmodulin, forms a calcium calmodulin complex, uh, then the calcium calmodulin complex leaves the calmodulin recruitment domain and is transferred onto the C2B protein, so what ha uh, C2B portion of the protein. So here is our calcium calmodulin complex now. Um, bound to C2B, and when it binds to C2B, what that does is it um, favours, it promotes the dimerization of C1A and C2A, basically, and you therefore get an active enzyme. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.